In the two days after he bought a gun, FBI Special Agent Erica Jensen testified. Hunter sent a text to his brother's widow and his ex-lover, Haley Biden, saying, waiting for a dealer named Mookie and sleeping on a car smoking crack on 4th and Rodney. Hunter wrote about his drug use in his memoir, Beautiful Things. Excerpts of that book were actually played in the courtroom, and we've got them. Here's one of them. I realized I was already running low on drugs. I rummaged through my car seats and floor mats for crumbs, then drove off sometime around midnight to score more. By now, I possessed a new superpower, the ability to find crack in any town at any time, no matter how unfamiliar the terrain. It was easy, risky, often frustrating, always stupid and stupendously dangerous, yet relatively simple if you didn't give much of a shit about your own well-being and were desperate enough to have an almost limitless appetite for debasement. Crack takes you into the darkest recesses of your soul. Prosecutors using Hunter's own words against him, even though he hasn't taken the stand. The jury, many of whom actually have dealt with addiction in some way, are hearing him speak, showing how he became this, quote, crack daddy to dealers. So how damaging is all of this to the defense case? Joining me now is prominent criminal defense attorney Mark Eiglarsh, an old friend. Mark, good to see you. Uh, how do you think the, uh, the defense is doing so far? How damaging is this testimony? They're doing the best they can at the level of awareness that they're at with the situation that they're in. That's a nice thing I can say. Dan, the first question is, why is this case going to trial? That really is the start. And quite frankly, it's sad and it's frustrating me that the judge didn't accept what the prosecutors thought was a reasonable outcome under the circumstances. They factored into the fact of this case that he had overcome his addiction, that people do desperate things during addiction. Let it go, but the judge wouldn't do it. And so now, as a legal matter, look, I made a similar argument about the Trump case as I've made about the Hunter Biden case, meaning the Trump hush money case. This is one mm -hmm. I didn't think should have uh, been brought, but technically he was probably guilty. Same thing that I'm thinking here, but as they're trying to show that on the date in yes. issue that he mm -hmm. wasn't on drugs, is that a viable defense? Well, yeah, let's break it down. There's two ways that they can find that he lied on the form. The first is, are you using drugs? Well, technically, he's not. He went into the place, and he wasn't using drugs at that moment. Maybe he wasn't using drugs a day before. No one's going to be able to pinpoint whether he was using drugs. They have the guy who sold him the drugs to essentially say, I would never have sold to somebody who looked like they were under the influence of drugs or alcohol. He didn't appear that way to me. Boom, check that off. He probably wasn't using drugs at the time, which is a fair reading of it. What's more complicated, as you know, and I'm getting to, is are you addicted? Are you an addict? Right. Well, that is complicated, right? It depends upon your definition of being an addict. Some people who are in recovery reject the notion of being called an addict. They don't like that label. Some people who are in early recovery also reject that notion. Maybe he's in deep denial about it, as the defense alleges. And so he's not lying, but he doesn't consider himself an addict. So is it really lying? That's the argument that they're going to be making. Some of the partisans who, you know, just want to see Hunter Biden guilty because he's Hunter Biden have been focusing on the jurors and pointing out that a lot of these jurors um, have experienced directly or indirectly some form of addiction. And I say indirectly, meaning friends, family, et cetera. Do you think that that's unusual? Is it unfair? What do you make of it? It's not unfair. We take jurors as we find them, right? It's not a partisan issue. Jurors come in with their own experiences, and they're allowed to use their common sense and their life experience. I don't know that it favors either side, because we don't really know how these individual jurors feel about addiction. Yeah. I think it's a toss-up, and I think it's a problem. They didn't know about NDAs. They didn't know about <laughs> bookkeeping and what you're supposed to do. This case is different. They come in with preconceived notions, which could affect both sides. Let me play a little bit more from uh, the excerpts from Hunter Biden's bi autobiography that were played. This is number one. I'm also an alcoholic and a drug addict. I bought crack cocaine on the streets of Washington, D.C. and cooked up my own inside a hotel bungalow in Los Angeles. I've been so desperate for a drink that I couldn't make the one block walk between a liquor store and my apartment without uncapping the bottle to take a swig. In the last five years alone, my two decades-long marriage has dissolved, 
Guns have been put in my face, and at one point, I dropped clean off the grid. I think it's possible, Mark, that some jurors will just feel bad for him? Absolutely. And let me tell you something. I don't think I'm alone here when I say in a case like this, that evidence sucks for the defense. It does. However, that's him looking back and realizing, yeah, I'm an addict. That's someone who's gone through treatment, who recognizes what an addict is. When he goes in to buy a gun, and if he's actively using at least some time around the time he's buying the gun, maybe he doesn't consider himself an addict at that point. So maybe he's not lying. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your cable provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.